you got sure you and you could probably still catch the end of the Bill Clinton thing. <laughs> Um, my name is Vince Musi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And Alex and Amy and Jim, it's a real honor to be up here with you guys. And hosting this uh, mega, mega talk, this uh, mega photography talk. Um, the National Geographic is one of the largest nonprofit scientific and educational organizations in the world. And there are people who specialize in everything from bugs and science, archaeology, underwater, culture, natural history. Now, I would not be one of them. <laughs> Under no circumstances do they play the theme song behind me when I go on assignment. This is not to say that I don't have adventure in my work. Uh, sometimes I do. And I. Um, like to take our readers uh, inside the photographer's hotel room for an often great view of the parking lot. <coughs> and on a science level, um, I have conclusively proved the incompatibility of cowboy hats and convertibles. <laughs> now, if I uh, previously had photographed an animal, it was make believe <laughs> or made of paper mache. If I made a portrait of a dog, it came with a cherry coke and a side of front. <laughs> so the notion of me becoming an animal photographer is all this guy's fault, Mike Hughes. Mike's the guy you call when you have critters living in your house. And so seven raccoons, nine squirrels, a brace of rats, mice, and snakes later, and the un undying and unwavering uh, support of natural history editor Kathy Moran, uh, pitched me a story on animal minds, smart animals. She'd lost her mind. I said, are you, are you kidding me? I said, you mean, you mean like that guy Bill Gecko? <laughs> he is a smart animal. I talked to him. I say 15% of my car insurance. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm thinking, Lassie, now Lassie was a smart animal. I mean, it is a good thing for little Timmy because he was always falling asleep on the railroad tracks, <laughs> getting in the middle of a bank robbery. Lassie would paw her way through a snowstorm to go tell mom that Timmy had fallen down a well again. <laughs> and those dogs. <laughs> now, they're pretty smart, but if they're so smart, why don't they ever catch those bulldogs that cheat? <laughs> I want to know what they're smoking in those pipes. <laughs> So here I am, I'm off on this story, on animal cognition. The idea is to do these uh, portraits of animals, these, these superstars of the cognitive field. Now, I don't know what they have to think about animals. And people say, well, it's pretty easy. You can do this. You just, you just bring a seamless, you go out there. Uh, most animals are food motivated. You can do this. Well, mistakes were made. <laughs> <laughs> Never, never feed a pig. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, that left a mark. Um, and, and you know how we always say that time, you know, a photographer, that time is the most important piece of equipment that you can have. But it never hurts to have an assistant and throw him in the ring with the, with the chimpanzees. Uh, we, we tried something here just to kind of get an idea what, what the chimp might do. It kind of worked out a little bit. Um, I will tell you, no animal gets stressed out when we do this. It's the most important thing we do is that everybody's comfortable. But that doesn't mean that we don't have patience to do it. But uh, often it gets tested when an animal doesn't want to have anything to do with you. So, uh, so the researchers, they, they call this enrichment. Uh, this is a lemur escaping. Uh, if you're going to photograph an animal, you ought to know where the hell the head of it is. Um, this is a Pacific giant octopus. They're pretty cool. Um, I don't know where his head is. I'm not sure where, where he starts and ends. Uh, he's looking at me. I look like this. And uh, I think you ought to know because he knew where my head is. Uh, pretty quick. He came after me. Um, pretty cool guys. Um, the screaming of, of animals is deafening, even underwater. Fish screamed at me. 
Um, this looks pretty cool. This is a marmoset. I've gone all the way to Austria to photograph him. His head is the size of a walnut. And he, um, it looks calm, doesn't it? Yeah. And uh, it's not. He's screaming at me. <laughs> really screaming. He's flying around the room. He's jumping on me. He's peeing on my equipment. And see, they say this is enrichment. This is good for the animal. They enjoy this kind of thing. And they enjoy messing with me. <laughs> and, and so at some point, you just give up. And you go, I, I, you, know, you do it. I don't care. Now, this, this Gunnison prairie dog, uh, he was rescued after he was hit by a car. Uh, his name is Speedball. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he screamed at me for four hours. And I, I thought, we've been going all the way uh, to photograph this guy. And I'm not going to get a picture of him. It's just not going to work. This is the one. I lose the thing. I go back to work into the 7-Eleven. And so I got desperate. I started, I, I, what do I do? I started to interview. Mr. Bubb, how does it feel to be living in Wabash after the summers in Phoenix? Is it much colder here? <laughs> and, it, and I got into this thing where I started, to, you know, I got kind of this do little thing. And all of a sudden, <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's another thing I would say about animals. They will poop and pee anywhere. Um, and any, any time they damn well please. So you should know that. Um, we put um, everything from a honeybee to a 9,000 pound elephant on a seamless background. Um, elephants have uh, self-awareness. They put them in front of a mirror. And instead of thinking it was a predator or not being sure what it was, they started to look at themselves, put the trunk up, that kind of thing. And that's a really extraordinary thing that elephants have. And they share it with humans and apes and dolphins. That's it. So our whole thing was to create a set of photographs all about eye contact, all over the world of different animals of different sizes, and all make them look like we're shot in the same day in the same place. Um, this is Betsy. She's a uh, border collie in, in Vienna. And uh, she has a vocabulary of more than 300 words. You could show Betsy a photograph of something, a stuffed animal, we call it Rondo, and say, find Rondo in the other room full of stuffed animals. Betsy will look at it, make the cognitive leap. The thing you want is in the photograph, and find it and bring it back does it two times and she has it locked away and it does go away. And she can do this with over 300 uh, words. It's an extraordinary dog. And, and, and we are in Vienna. We're, we're in, uh, in suburban Vienna. And her owner is leaning over me with one of those Vienna sausages. This is how we got that. She, so she was indeed food motivated no matter how much. <laughs> Um, this is Wack, a new Caledonian crow. He spent two days trying to poke my eyes out with that beak of his. <laughs> they, uh, they use those beaks to make tools, and they uh, make tools from materials they have never seen before to solve problems they have never been presented before. Uh, pretty extraordinary animals. Uh, that's the lemur. I did get him. He didn't get away. What I learned over the course of this was uh, just like dealing with humans, uh, body language and, and, and how you approach an animal is, always, is just as important as it is in photographing a person. So every time I picked the camera, he was gone. So if I never looked through it, if I just kept it down and kind of kept the record going with him, we worked out just fine. We had a great time. He uses the touch screen, and he counts like you do when you're learning how to count as a kid. Um, this is Kanzi. He is one of the superstars of the cognitive world. He lives in Des Moines. And uh, he communicates using this series of lexigrams. Uh, and he carries them around like uh, laminated uh, mats from a, from a diner. And he points to symbols and he makes complex sentences. He can ask questions, he'll respond to things. And he wanted, in order for me to photograph him, uh, half a dozen uh, grande Starbucks coffees with the simple syrup. <laughs> for he and his bonobo friends. Uh, he's a pretty cool guy. And, and, uh, a really a, a, an extraordinary, extraordinary individual. Uh, in the scientific world, these animals are more colleagues than they are subjects, and it's hard to get to understand that. Uh, careers have been based on their on research with them. Books have been written. They are truly, in every case that we could, they are truly the superstars of this world. Um, this is Alex. Alex was an African gray parrot, and he came from Chicago, believe it or not, was born here in 1977, purchased in a pet shop, and uh, he was so famous that when he passed away, his obituary was in the New York Times. Um, he could count uh, to seven. He could have a conversation with you on a certain level. He knew the difference between colors and shapes and sizes. Um, and a really most extraordinary bird. And when I went to Brandeis to photograph him, they, 
They have a small space. These folks don't have a lot of money to do this research, so they just gave them to me. Here you go. Take it. What do you mean? Well, there's no room in here to do this. So I set up in the hallway, and people would go, is that? And I'd go, uh-huh. Who the hell are you? <laughs> I sat with him for three hours and tried to teach him the theme song from Herbie the Love Bug, and, uh, and we had a blast. And at the end of the session, when it was done, he said, uh, where'd you tip on me? You know, I'm by myself. It's like a little kid. It's like a ventriloquist. Excuse me? Would you tickle me? Uh, <laughs> Show me where. Daisy's a beautiful rank, and his head is this big. These animals teach us the boundaries of humanity, what things are human and what things are not. Uh, we've learned so many things uh, about us. Maya, the dolphin, wrapping this up. I want to show you another body of work. Um, we never did this again, kind of. This was crazy, right? Um, so what, they gave me this other story, and it was about the domestication of plants and animals, which is arguably the single most important event in modern human history going back 15,000 years. And we know nothing about it. We don't know how it happened, or why it happened, or what the criteria was. So I'm fascinated by this, because I'm looking at how does an animal go from being hunted to being raised for food. How does an animal over 10,000 years uh, go from the dining room to the living room? <laughs> uh, a Russian geneticist set out to try it. Uh, this whole relationship that we have with animals, he wanted to figure out if there was some sort of gene. And we now know that there's a genetic marker that may uh, explain why 14 out of 150 large mammals have been able to domesticate. Uh, you can domesticate a horse, but not a zebra, but nearly identical. Why? We don't know. Um, so he set out to domesticate this animal, the silver fox, uh, and tried to do it, and did it successfully in eight generations. And 50 later, these animals now, are not, they're not raised as pets, but have lived as pets. This, this fox is uh, just like having a dog. It's uh, in, a, in a home in uh, St. Petersburg. So uh, this research still continues to looking at the genetic uh, level and why these things happen. Uh, and they're looking at domesticating for different reasons. So these rats are really friendly, they're really nice and all that kind of stuff. And then in the other room, they've got these rats that are not so nice. <laughs> <laughs> now, I adore dioramas in the museums. I, I just think they're just beautiful. They're, they're frozen in time, they're theatrically lit, they are you know, they're iconic and they're handmade. And that was my approach to this, was to try to create dioramas from real life. We didn't set up any of these photographs. They are all real. I've got a guy with a big light like that, larger, running around wherever we go, and we're making momentary daylight and trying to create this kind of look. These are wolves. Wolves are the progenitors of all dogs. And so these, these bizarre uh, contrasts, these, these wolves are wild animals. They're chained up, but chained. They're going for a walk in a parking lot in, in, uh, in Colorado. Um, and we look at the differences uh, of what's happening in terms of dogs. Dogs are evolving because of domestication. They're picking up on these social cues that humans have. And they do this now at a much greater rate than great apes do. Um, so there's changes. These dogs are uh, bred, and all they do is chase cats, bobcats. Uh, they are hunting dogs. They will not chase a deer. They won't do, that. They won't do anything but chase bobcats. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. We went to Kazakhstan to photograph horses. Uh, early domestications were not necessarily done for labor or transportation. Horses were domesticated for food. And uh, you will still find people who eat them, and you will still find people who milk them, uh, every bit as much as you'll find in that place uh, million dollar racehorses. Um, probably the most uh, domesticated animal in the world is, is the chicken. 24 billion chickens worldwide, which means that the wild progenitors, these uh, red jungle fowl, are very few in, in, in pure bloodlines. Some of the purest ones are actually in the United States with some weird experiment going already in the 60s. Um, but you, you start to look at what is it that we're looking for? What are we breeding for? What are we after? These chickens are both about nine weeks old. And they both have eating disorders. One will eat itself to death, and the other is anorexic. Um, and it is how poultry manufacturers are able to produce an animal that is a certain size at a certain period 
And they don't do it with hormones. They're not doing it with this, a lot of things we think. It's purely in breeding. It's all in the gene. Um, so this notion of selection fascinated me. And so I started to look at sheep. And we went to the Indiana State Fair and looked at how, again, animals are now, what are their pets? Are they, these are dairy goats, but they're kind of pets. And I'm not sure what, what, what's going on. So we, uh, oh, so we did all of the sheep at the Indiana State Fair. There's a lot of sheep at the Indiana State Fair. And I thought that was pretty cool, because all sheep, like dogs, come from one place, one animal. And all of the colors have been bred out of these things. And so you have this incredible diversity just in one simple animal that we've done. So I guess we kind of get back to the studio thing. Um, and I want to end with one more thing that I'd love to show you. And I've been given permission to do this. And it's unusual for Geographic. This will run in December. It's a story. And it's a little piece I just did uh, on big cats, lions, jags, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's a series of portraits that we did. Um, and it's going to be a full out in the magazine in December. This is a clouded leopard. A jaggy one. Beautiful, I think. This is gorgeous. I've never been around big cats. We kind of did the studio thing. We took it there. Uh, but none of these animals are under our control. They are not stunt animals. They're not drugged up. They're not chained up. These are wild animals. Um, they're in the zoo, but they're not, you know, they're not like the ones you see in the movies. And stuff. Cheetah. And a beautiful tiger whose name I can't, I don't know, I just call him Shere Khan. And, you know, all the way when I'm doing this stuff, because I, I, I'll always ask, I'll say, you know, are they getting stressed out? Should we go? How long do you go? Because, you know, it's not like photographing the kid, you got five minutes. You don't know. You can't ask them. How do you know? Well, they're grooming. They're okay. You'll know. I said, why do I know? I said, you'll know. 